Thank you for watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Claire Twain. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the relationship of Palestinian Americans to their government in light of recent cases of harassment and deportations of American citizens traveling to Israel. Here with me to discuss these issues are Dr. James Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, and Sandra Tamari, a Palestinian American who was recently denied entry into Israel. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Sandra, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you were deported from Israel on the 22nd of May. Could you briefly talk about that experience? What was most egregious about it? You know, I, I didn't expect. I was uh, traveling with a group of American citizens who were uh, there for an interfaith delegation trip. We were there to speak to Palestinians and Israelis that are working from all sides of the issue. Um, I was the only person um, pulled out of the immigration line, immediately um, asked about the names of my father and my grandfather. And um, then it was eight hours of interrogations that focused on um, who I knew in the region and um, what I planned to do. And then it got into my political activities here in the US and then demands to get into my email account. So how long did it take until you really knew that you wouldn't be able to enter into Israel? Um, it really did take eight hours. Um, there were threats of being denied entry from the beginning, um, lots of threats to try to get me to give them more information um, that I didn't have, um, lots of uh, even threats about if I was denied entry into Israel that it would haunt me back here in the U.S. Um, you know, those kinds of things to try to intimidate me into opening my email. I mean, we've heard other accounts recently that, you know, younger people have given access to their email accounts and it hasn't been of any benefit. They've also been denied entry into the country. So Dr. Zogby, in your experience, are these deportations of Palestinian Americans a, a common occurrence? Uh, and the deportations are not common, but the deportations have occurred. But the harassment at the border is common. And, um, and it, it, it doesn't make a difference whether you go through the, the bridge over from Jordan or whether you come into the airports. The only difference is, is that if you're denied entry, um, the bridge, you just drive back to Oman. But if it's the uh, airport, then you're stuck and you have to buy a ticket uh, back home. But I think the harassment getting in and the harassment leaving, uh, which is the one that's equally uh, frustrating and almost weird in a perverse sort of way. I mean, you're leaving the damn place. Just let me go. But the same routine with the same questions and the same nonsense uh, repeated over and over again by uh, individuals, new people who come onto the scene. Um, I, I just need to ask you a few questions after you've asked and answered, have been asked and answered the same questions to uh, two or three other people. Um, it, it's a kind of a punishment, I think, to discourage you from coming or to make you pay a price for getting in. So. Yeah, I think that this is par for the course, but the deportation issue is, is something that I think happens less frequently than the harassment. So why does Israel get away with such discriminatory treatment of American citizens, especially given how much aid and support it receives from the United you know, States? It, 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 the problem is, is that you, you would have to get the United States government to do something uh, about it. And I, I guess I believe that, um, that, you know, when the Secretary of State tells me directly, I've done this, uh, I've, I've raised the issue with the Justice Minister, or when Bill Clinton is introducing me to uh, Ehud Barak at an event at the White House and says, um, he has something to say to you, Mr. Prime Minister, and then gives me the floor to speak to Barack about this issue, they've raised it, but they lack the political will to do something about it. and. Um, and so Israel feels, um, you know, like Br'er Rabbit and the Briar Patch. Oh no, you're going to mention this. Mentioning it is easy to do. Um, doing something about it is the tough one. And I have not seen any administration willing to, to do it. What is angering, therefore, about it is that um, it's not just another issue. It, it basically says we're second-class citizens, that there are three kinds of citizenship as far as Israelis are concerned. There's American Jews who are by right uh, e e e entitled to Israeli citizenship. Then there's average everyday Americans 
who are fully respected as American citizens, and then there's us. And we're viewed as not quite fully Americans as far as the Israelis are concerned. And they know that our own government is not going to defend us, and so they basically have carte blanche. Even though we have a treaty uh, that requires both countries to respect each other's citizens as they travel within their borders, and even though the Secretary of State in our passport makes a pledge that, that our rights will be defended. Those pledges are honored more in the breach than in the observance. Well, Sandra, how does that response compare to the response that you received on the day of your deportation from the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv? Right, so as any U.S. citizen would, if you're running into trouble in a foreign country, you call your embassy, um, which is what I did. Um, the duty officer that was on the night that I was being detained um, called, and the first question they asked me is, are you Jewish? Um, the question was meant to decide if I was going to be able to get help from our embassy or not. I met with the State Department this morning and they said I may have heard the question incorrectly, that I may have you know, uh, misinterpreted, maybe the person didn't express himself as well as he might have. Um, but it comes down to you know, the, the fact that the U.S. Embassy is adopting Israel's um, discriminatory policies in deciding if they can help U.S. citizens or not. Were you surprised by that response or did you expect it? I didn't expect it. No, of course I was surprised. I, I was certainly very tired. Um, this is, you know, well into my uh, interrogation after a, a long uh, flight. Um, and I, you know, I was, of course, you know, dealing with lots of new things and lots of shock at being held back away from my group. Um, so it was a surprise to me. I don't think that I reacted. Um, you know, very, very quickly. I think that was in some ways a good thing because, you know, the questions continued and it was only after reflection that I realized, wow, I was just profiled and um, my government is um, treating me differently because I'm a Palestinian. Dr. Zogby, you were talking about this, mentioning the second class citizens. Do you think that Sandra's treatment by the U.S. Embassy is representative of the broader relationship between Palestinian Americans and their government? In, in this particular instance, yes. I, I think that if the violator of our rights is Israel, we can pretty much discount getting those rights protected. It's sad, but it's true. And I, I think it's important for me to note that when I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign back in 1977, that the first two cases we adopted were of American citizens who had been, at that point, tortured in Israel, tortured into signing confessions, and we got almost no reaction from the U.S. Embassy or, or, or later on from the State Department. So, uh, yeah, if, if it, in, in every instance, uh, American citizens ought to be able to count on their government. And, you know, as we say, if you turn it around and say, this is an American Jew being treated this way in an Arab country, what would the reaction be? You get the picture. It's a Palestinian or an Arab American being treated this way by Israel and they will shrug and they'll sigh and they'll say oh you know it's a shame but uh, there's nothing we can do and that's that's been pretty much part of the course of look I, I, I back in the 90s I was running a project for Vice President Gore called Builders for Peace and uh, it required me to go a, a lot um, there was one particular time when Vice President had asked me to join him at a dinner at the Knesset um, to talk about economic issues uh, there. And um, I, uh, I spent hours in the airport. I had a letter from the Vice President. I, I, I took, because the only flight I could get to get over there in time was an LL -L flight from New York. I spent almost two hours before I got on the plane going through this stuff, singled out among all the other passengers. Um, I got there and I got the same treatment. Um, and I finally, when I saw the Vice President, I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, you want me to support peace, and by the time I get through this, I'm so angry that it's really hard to do it. Well, they got me for a couple of trips, then an embassy escort. But, but an American citizen shouldn't have to do that. I mean, I shouldn't have to get special treatment so I could go in and do the job I'm supposed to do. Um, but most Americans of Arab descent get that kind of treatment. And I would add, some Americans not of Arab descent get that, mm -hmm. get that kind of treatment. You don't think it's specific to Palestinian it Americans? It is specific to Palestinian Americans, but it extends to others. But if you're Palestinian American, you know you're going to get it. If you're not, you might get it. 
if you don't come up with the right answers right away. Sandra, what do you think about Dr. Zogby's assessment? Uh, do you think that you've seen this influence in your other interactions with the U.S. government? Um, certainly. I think that it, it is specific to Palestinian Americans, but I think it extends to anyone who wants to um, show solidarity to Palestinians. Certainly, there have been Jewish Americans that have also been denied entry, and those are the people that are going in to show solidarity with Palestinians. There are lots of international activists that have been denied entry, as we know, with the recent uh, campaigns to fly in to Tel Aviv and declare that you're going um, to visit Palestinians. Those people are denied entry, um, and that's simply because they want to show solidarity uh, with people in the West Bank and in Gaza, and um, those people are seen as a threat to Israel. So it's, it really seems like it's the Israel factor. Uh, Dr. Zogby, what role does Congress play in all of this? Does it have an impact on this relationship? Congress is the, the as George Bush used to say, they're the decider. Um, I, I think that if we didn't have the politics that come out of Congress, we'd probably get administrations and state departments to be more aggressive in this. But they have the 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 sort of the looming uh, threat of Congress hanging over their heads, um, and that's why I, I think we all can imagine that if an administration did in fact stand up to Israel, um, you can you can hear right now the whoops and cries from members of Congress and the hearings that would be convened and the the denouncing that would take place. I mean it. it uh, the, the politics of Congress loom large in this. Sandra, I know you appealed to your senator, um, I think, congressman. your congressman. Uh, what did they say? What was the response on that side, if any? Well, this is a congressman that votes consistently for military aid to Israel, so I wasn't expecting um, much, to be quite honest. Um, but in the end, he was very sympathetic and, you know, said that he would make inquiries to state. I think that part of what happens is that, you know, in my State Department meeting, they said it's Congress's fault. And in, in my meetings with Congress, they say, oh, this is, this is unreal, this is state's fault. I mean, I don't think that anyone wants to take responsibility. Um, they want, they support Israel, they know they do, they're on the record of doing so. Um, but in the end, they don't want to take responsibility for what that support actually means um, when they're faced with discrimination of a U.S. citizen. Um, what I would say also is that, you know, while Congress seems to have um, all the power, um, that in the end it really is, it's going to take a grassroots movement to change um, anything that happens in Washington. A lot of people are going to be asking me now, you know, what happened in the State Department? Because they, they still believe that change happens in Washington. And I would just, you know, urge everyone to remember that change never happens in Washington until there's a grassroots uh, movement that's asking for that change, demanding that change. And uh, we were able to take 17,000 signatures today on a petition um, to state um, asking them to end discrimination against U.S. citizens abroad. Um, it's a start. We have to build a campaign that's going to demand the change. And have you seen uh, changes in the way that Palestinian Americans are engaging with our government? I mean, I absolutely do. I mean, I'm, I, I live in the Midwest, so it's nice to be far away from, you know, the perceived power. Um, what we're seeing is that the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions has really mobilized um, people across the country. That you're seeing, you know, civic organizations, student groups that are that have a mission. They know what they need to be doing. Um, it's being led by all kinds of great national groups um, and you know grassroots organizations. So I think that's what where the hope lies. Dr. Zogby, do you agree, or do you think there's another way that Palestinian Americans should be engaging with our government to ensure equal treatment? Oh, I think there's multiple ways for Palestinian Americans, but I, I think that the, um, the, the, the current movement that is afoot um, to, to find ways to exercise power on the grassroots level and to create opportunities for folks on campuses, uh, in communities, to create a boycott or a divestment uh, uh, initiative is, uh, is eminently supportable um, and does clearly send a message. It's got some guys very nervous here. Um, but uh, at the same time, I, I think that there's a role for leadership and, and a role that, that, you know, the president can do it. Uh, I, and, and this, oh, I can't Congress, you know, whatever, nonsense. Uh, and the State Department can do it if they, if they were so inclined to do so. And so we'll keep pushing on that level. Um, 
as well. And there are some courageous voices in Congress. There are some good people, and historically have always been good people. The question is for us to continue to cultivate them um, and, to, um, and, and to, to do that, and to build coalitions that go beyond the normal coalitions that we've been involved in. I think that this issue uh, in particular is one that when I bring it to the, the ethnic council that I'm a, a part of, um, and Polish Americans and Irish Americans and others hear about it, they, they want to sign on. I, I got a really, really strong letter from uh, Irish Democrats um, uh, in support of what we were doing on this issue. So th there are many ways to the same goal. And, um, and I think that uh, this is one where you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try them all and, and continue to work together on it. Well, thank you both for taking the time to be with us on Palestine Studies TV. Thank you.